With the increasing number of droughts, floods, landslides, and earthquakes, we are losing our biodiversity at a very alarming pace. All natural disasters are somehow interconnected with each other. And to cope with nature's fury, we have to work really close with it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Navin Times Talk from the Heart. Our guest today is Namrata Kashyap. She is a principal architect and proprietor at NKLD. Hello, Namrata, and welcome to our show. Thank you, Maria. Namrata, you started NKLD, which stands for Namrata Kashyap Landscape Designs, in 2004. It started as a one-woman enterprise, and today it has metamorphosed into a sustainable practice. Tell us about your journey. So, Maria, I came to Goa in the year 2000, and uh, I got married to a naval officer. That's how I was lucky enough to come to Goa and fell in love with it immediately. And I have done my uh, bachelor's in town planning and my master's in landscape architecture. I was very keen to pursue um, my uh, career. So I started by uh, teaching in the Goa Architecture College. And from there is where I started off getting my first project. So I started off literally on my own with my own computer in my house on my study table, going to the site. And in fact, I remember my first project was for uh, Mr. Pramod Deshpande, who's a chartered accountant in uh, Vasco. Okay. And uh, I would design his project and go on his site and actually uh, mark out the areas with the pipe and literally worked on the land. And then that's how my practice grew. Slowly I hired more people. People heard about my work. And uh, you'll be very happy to know that now we're an all-women enterprise. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, it's not that we don't want to have um, gentlemen working with us. In fact, we have had them, but uh, they work with us for a year or two, and I think then they get so good, they go to the Middle East. Okay. <laughs> so, the, in a way, that is a compliment that they're learning so much from you, right? Oh, yes, and they're wonderful boys. Every time they are back into Goa, they make sure they come to us, and they take the whole whole office out for a good lunch. That's and, nice. uh, you know, Salim and Abdul, if you're listening to this, I mean, God bless you. So uh, right now we have a lot of women. We are eight women and architects, draftsmen, as well as architectural assistants. And uh, we are, yes, totally into a sustainable practice. Good. Now, NKLD borrows a lot from traditional designs, from nature. And you said that, that you know, that is where the ethos of your of a company comes from, that we learning from nature. Can you give us some examples of uh, some of these designs that you have done? So as we um, all know, we are blessed with a lot of very good traditional practices right. in, and we have a very rich uh, culture and culture and architecture are very closely linked to each other. So we were very mindful of what our ancestors have done, which worked and stood through the tests of time. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, looking at what was modern uh, technology uh, and how it would be a design statement, we thought it would be very mindful to borrow the traditional design practices which mm -hmm. we've been following over the years and marry technology with it as a tool so that uh, it would be very relevant for today. At the same time, it would be long lasting. Right. So that was a, yes, it was beyond our technical education. That was a research which we did as, uh, as NKLD. And we brought uh, we brought in uh, the concept of the courtyards, which was a traditional practice, into our designs. We brought in the uh, I mean, I'm not. We are not the only ones who have done it. Of course, yes, there are other yes, practices. Yes, yes. But courtyards, I would say, is uh, the most uh, relevant. What we have brought in, we have then uh, desi designing for good ventilation and light is something that also our ancestors had been doing for the longest period of time because we, they were not dependent on any kind of a mechanical energy supports. So that is again something that we have been mindful of, being very local, using vernacular materials, using the local vegetation mm -hmm. and the local uh, having a very good study like we do pan India projects. So wherever we are working, we do a lot of research on what were the traditional 
practices, of what that are the place. cultural beliefs of that particular area, right. which are vast and varied, as you know, because as you just go 200 kilometers and the whole uh, landscape changes. changes. Yes, so that has been a very interesting study, and I think it's a continuous, ongoing education for us. It is. Yes, so uh, it's, it's great. I totally love what we do. You know, Namrata, someone, a wise man, has said, we learn every day, and the moment we stop learning, we are dead. So, yes. learning is something that we have to take a free and learn and relearn, as they say. No two projects of us are the same because yes. a we are in different parts of um, India, and secondly, no two landscape projects are the same. By and large, landscape architects are hired when there are certain constraints of the site. Mm -hmm. If it is uh, only for uh, making the site look good, I am sure there are a lot of very competent horticulturists, gardeners who can assist. Landscape architects come in when you consciously want to manage your resource of soil, of energy, of water. And, and building materials as well. And the building materials and you are very mindful of having a, uh, reducing your carbon footprint. So mm -hmm. that is when the landscape architect is brought in and we are very happy to see now the site planning is our forte. Uh, and earlier there were times where landscape architects would be coming in only towards the end just to make the site look good. good. But now everybody understands that role and we are in from the site planning level itself where we help in the location of the building, the orientation, the accesses, what are the uh, natural resources of the site which we need to conserve, what are the views from the site which we need to optimize so on and so forth. I think we are able to help the principal designer, which is the main lead architect, for taking very mindful decisions. So basically, it is this synergy that is required from all you know different aspects. Not only right now the architect, the landscape architect as well. Then, like you said, horticulturists. Everybody comes in to make that project. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, all these divisions are done for, uh, I think, just for academic convenience. Mm -hmm. And they have a very large overlap with each other. Yes. So, um, yeah, definitely, I would say that the lead when you're designing is the client who has, have, has a particular sense of purpose. And uh, then you have the principal architect who would be designing the vision and the building and then you have the landscape architect who will understand the lay of the land mm -hmm. and respect it and build with it. And then you have the uh, the building contractors who are going to actually uh, put bring it all reality into, yes, into, yes, yes, into yes, practice so and get it there, yes. get that physical structure up and about. Just before the interview, um, I was speaking with Namrata and she spoke about her home which she has designed uh, it herself, obviously. And uh, she t spoke about how unique it is. And let's hear from her what she has to say. Tell us about your home that you have. You, I, I, I could see the pride in your eyes when you were speaking, so we would love to know what more about it. Yes, yeah, so this uh, home which uh, I have designed for our family with a lot of help, I would say. I have very good professionals such as uh, Rajesh Mahamre, who's a structural engineer, and Siddharth Naik, who's an architect, who helped me visualize this. Uh, we did, uh, we have a lovely plot which is uh, adjoining a forest. So we were blessed to have okay. that and uh, so we oriented it as per our uh, hope to never have to switch on any lights or any fans during the day. So we have a central courtyard wow. and we have all our rooms around One it. One moment, let me get this right. You are, did I hear right, you are saying you never have to use lights or, or cooling or heating. It, is that what you say during the day and we've just moved into the house so we hope to it to be a success so far we are doing very well and the way we've oriented the house uh, it is an it's a west facing plot and uh, we have the courtyard in the center so light and ventilation we don't have any kind of uh, we have minimized any kind of mechanical uh, energy systems everything is natural the building material the base material that we've used these are porotherm blocks so these blocks are made from fallow land clay, which cannot be used for agriculture. Okay. So this is a company called Wienerberger, which is manufacturing them, which is in Tumkur, 300 kilometers from here. So we have used them and we've used them raw. We have not done any kind of treatment on the external face. So these blocks are, um, they are hollow blocks. So they so are they allow, porous? they are so porous. Right. So they allow movement of air. So as you know, you know, you have a um, air moves from a high pressure to low pressure, low temperature, high temperature. So that whole movement is uh, allowed. Also, the 
plaster that you use inside we've used lime plaster which was again a traditional practice right. which somewhere down the line we lost it because it's time consuming and it's an artisanal job which are difficult uh, and these it's artists expensive, isn't are it? difficult to find well the truth is that the net cost uh, you'll be surprised is the same it's just okay. much more time consuming because the raw material is much cheaper lime as compared to cement but the artisans they are so far and few now that okay. the you know what you have to Getting pay them, them is yes them out. yes and it is time consuming maria so that i understand now why people want to move quickly and move into cement but this is much longer lasting and plus it's a it's always emanating oxygen lime so it's a healthier option whereas whenever you use the cement plaster it is uh, releasing carbon dioxide so this will always be cooler the next time you go to any of these old uh, buildings which is the forts and the palaces you just touch the plaster it's always very cool yes yeah so that's the lime plaster that they use and go it becomes stronger with time okay so you know it's like we just all have to have a thing a lot of patience when we are building our homes and you know then yes. everything falls falls but in place number th- as you rightly said we all in a hurry we all want things as quickly as possible and we forget you know the natural resources and we just move ahead very very blindly now sustainability is a phrase that is being used very very loosely even school children are learning about sustainability how in today's scenario would you define sustainability it's actually really simple i feel that we are the trustees of the natural resources that we inherit from the earth this current generation and our job is to be mindful of how we use them so that we can pass them on to the next generation as it's as simple as that so we have to be very mindful of all our all our resources that we have whether it is soil whether it is um, Uh, the minerals that we have like goa is blessed it is how we op- use them for growth but in a mindful way that we are not de- uh, having any kind of a detrimental impact or at least minimizing the detrimental impact on the planet so that we can pass on this planet whole and bountiful to the Truth next generation yeah yes and you know um you have said somewhere i was reading something about it that to be sustainable our, our designs have to be very resilient uh, can you explain that uh, in simple terms please don't yes. tell us things that we wouldn't yes even uh, resilient would mean that you should have the ability to face whatever is coming your way to be able to be alive while you're facing what you're doing and then have the ability to resurrect this is true as an individual as a planet or as a community so if you re- if you recall earlier we had a lot of data and we had uh, uh, all areas we could predict that if you are going to goa or if you are going to simla this is the weather in this particular season this is the kind of clothes you need to wear and uh, life will go on this is the maximum it will go this is the minimum but today we are not in those times everything is unpredictable so when we talk about resilience it means uh, for any design now to be sustainable is it should be able to anticipate what are the possibilities it could face you cannot you cannot rely on data and you do not know now what is in store for you next year with climate change so any design needs to be able to anticipate and it should be able to absorb what it is going to face it should be able to mitigate any kind of a negative impact that it's going to have and it should be able to adapt and resurrect so that is a resilient design for example we need to design now um, floods are a reality landslides earthquakes they are a reality we are, we are so what we need to do is instead of them getting you down you need to have a design which is able to uh, sustain itself or survive that landslide it should be able to survive that earthquake survive that flood if you recall many years ago again traditional practice mm-hmm. uh, if you realize that the, we had towns and villages where they had all their um, um, community areas at a much higher level whether it would be a temple or whether it would be a church or a mosque or whether it would be uh, you know the main area where they would store their agricultural produce the surplus they would all be at the highest points of the village why would that be so 
so that at the because they knew that there would be floods and at that point of time the whole it could house the whole community and it could it had had enough reserves so we need to actually again look back into our traditional practices and borrow from them uh, so townships need to be designed for the floods you have floods which are going to come you know we have the data also for that that yes. once in 5 years once in 10 years Recent once in 25 100 years the kerala floods so these are and uh, you know the, however far they are between each other that they are that strong right so the 1 in 100 flood is going to be major so if we need to design our towns to have these kind of open spaces which allow the flooding to happen and then recede so i think that is where we need to be mindful of having large community spaces which double up also as uh, areas for potentially absorbing these kind of flood situations mm -hmm. right now i have heard someone once mentioning that i think it was an architect i spoke with who spoke about biomimicry um, what in simple terms again how would you uh, describe it and can you give us some examples so we can connect it with a picture in our, an image in our mind bio biomimicry is to basically be inspired by nature and to absorb those aspects into design so if you will see whatever is man made whenever it is exposed to any kind of a disaster it does um, get destroyed or it does get severely damaged right but how is it that we have the river nile who has faced so many onslaughts of nature and is still uh, running its course how is it like the the baobab trees are 6000 years old and they have been exposed to so many you know whether it is lightning whether it is earthquakes floods how is it that they are standing so it is a, it is something that we need to study mm -hmm. that we there are nature is withstanding all right. all the disasters so how why don't we just take a leaf out of that book so people have done that even if you see in town planning if you see how we do our uh, road networks they are based they are uh, inspired from the veins of a leaf or if you will also see how we do block development urban design it is uh, derived from the cell structure if you mm -hmm. will see how they are you know little little blocks and then that's how we actually do design and that is how they have uh, they have stood the test of time otherwise specifically if you will see in japan they have done very advanced studies mm -hmm. so they have in fact seen that how the beak of the kingfisher is the way it is aerodynamically designed it can uh, go at very high speeds so they have in were inspired by that and that's how they did the bullet train that shinkansen bullet train okay and uh, yes it has this it has exactly yes. the same snout that the kingfisher yes. does so yeah. it is like this and then it's sort of slanting absolutely right? absolutely in zimbabwe they were very inspired by the ant hills if you see the ant hills are a huge network and how is it and they are the coolest there's amazing ventilation through so they were inspired by the ant hill and they went ahead and did a building which is uh, i think more than 60 meters if i'm not wrong this is in zimbabwe in zimbabwe and it has absolutely no artificial air conditioning systems they totally used the concept of the ant hill it's very interesting so the ant hill basically it is very porous on the inside right it has this network of tunnels so they have a area from where they can pull in the air and okay. then it goes through these tunnels and it goes through the whole building And that's it you know, that's how hot hot air rises up cool air is down so that's where they pull the air in and then as it gets heated up it moves out and then again the circle forms and that's how the whole ventilation of the building is based on this they don't have any air conditioning wow do we have anything like that in india we all our traditional homes were like that you see or uh, at the community no, level no i'm talking about any a uh, new design uh, that is based on something like that the a lot of them are coming up now we have this uh, school which has been designed just now in uh, gujarat where they have used the same principles and it is very hot over there again they have yes. been able to channelize uh, the air in such a way that it cools the system as while well. it is flowing through it so That's we are we are now very happy to say that we are now actually going back going back to our systems and we are of course improving them modernizing them and technology is definitely mm -hmm. a great tool and we are able to now smartly you know marry technology with our practices and india is doing some very really good stuff now right right it is interesting speaking with her namrata has so much more to share but let us take a small break don't go anywhere we'll be right back <music>
Hello and welcome back to the Navin Times Talk from the Heart. We are in conversation with Namrata Kashyap. Namrata, you have been giving us beautiful examples. Now, in Goa, space is slowly and steadily becoming scarce in the sense that people do not have the open um, houses, you know, the open spaces that we used to have earlier. Now everyone is moving to apartments or smaller, very, very small houses, which are very compact. If I were a landscape enthusiast and I wanted to bring some element of nature, of, of design into my home, how should I go about it? A few tips. Don't give me your uh, trade secrets, but some <laughs> tips. And so they're basically uh, a successful design is able to stimulate all the human senses of sight, of sound, of smell, mm -hmm. and of your being. So how do we do that? So a good design, like if you have an apartment, but you do want to be very well connected to all your you know, sensory senses, it's it's very uh, it's a good idea to get whatever are the local plants into your balconies. Hopefully, we have balconies in the apartments yes. or in your wash areas. There's a lot of in plants which do very well in the indoors. You can in your washroom areas. You can have a little plant over there because definitely uh, uh, the relaxation that you feel when you see any form of nature is far more than any kind of uh, social media entertainment that we depend on nowadays. Right. So I think it's really important to bring in, so that's for the visuals, then for the sound, you, if you can have, now we have these recycling water bodies, uh, which are very small and compact, could be, used in, could be put in anywhere in your living areas or in your, if you have a relaxation area outside, you have these self-contained water bodies. They have a very soothing sound of water. Mm -hmm. The other would be if you love to have the sound of birds. So if you could be planting uh, uh, flowering trees or flowering shrubs, then you have the little birds who do come in and nest, in fact, also in your area. So I think that would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then you tuck in fragrant plants uh, strategically with these flowering because uh, like nature wanted to be very fair. So by default, fragrant plants are not very beautiful because they have such a strong sense of fragrance and those uh, who are uh, flowering not necessarily don't are, have that fragrance. are fragrant. Of right. course we have exceptions, we yes. have the roses yes. and uh, we True. have uh, chrysandras, a zaizui, a couple of them mm -hmm. who are beautiful as mm -hmm. well. Uh, but uh, by and large like the night queen, the night jasmine you can tuck in. You can put the fraggy pani if you have that kind of luxury of space, a nice tree, sculptural tree. These do well in balconies as well. And um, seasonal variation is another thing which is very important so that you don't always have a monotonous view. So you could probably put in say five or six varieties of flowers, which some of them flower in the summer, some in the winter, so that you have a dynamic landscape mm -hmm. uh, always in your uh, balconies. So you said also in the wash area, like what are the plants you would recommend that we can use? Uh, so you have the jade, you have these anthuriums, and uh, you have uh, aurelias and uh, you have any kind of succulent varieties they can do well as long as you keep them close to your ventilators uh, okay. with a little bit of sun and they need very little water that's for the succulents for these aurelias and for these uh, bromeloids bromeloids would be like your uh, dracaenas and your uh, um, you have then you have this prayer plant and you have the you prayer this, plant yes the prayer plant, then you have the snakehood lilies, the spathiphyllum, which are these little white uh, lilies that you have. Do they have the, that yellow, uh, you know, like a, I don't know what it's called. Yeah, they have a central uh, petiole and then they ha they're beautiful white. They are, they're called the snakehood lily because they're almost like this, right. white and then a little upright. So they do very well in semi-shade conditions. You okay. Can, yeah. Now, Namrata, in Goa, like you rightly said, you know, you cannot predict what the weather, what the climate is going to be like. Initially, we could do that, not anymore. I remember what, I, I'm, I'm not sure which year it was, we had gone for mass, it was Christmas, and it suddenly started raining. And, you know, there was a bundle that was put up and everybody had to rush in to the church. This was in an open area. So with Goa right now, it's not yet started, but I can already feel the heat, heat and humidity are constant. 
we are lucky that in the last one month it has been nice and cool. So to combat uh, this heat, how can we, what can we do in our homes and while we are designing our homes that will help? Uh, when we're designing a home, then uh, like I mentioned, you orient it in such a way that no. you are able to have good, good air circulation. So the, ori the spatial planning would be important. And uh, then you do have these open spaces interwoven with your home, like a courtyard is what yes. I is very uh, good for a right. place like Goa. And if you're, uh, when you're choosing building materials, then you need to have breathable building materials because definitely in a place like Goa, you would want to use something like the lime plaster, the hollow blocks, because mm -hmm. then you allow the air, air flow and the humidity also gets pretty well balanced with this. I think lime plaster is a great option for a humid area because it pulls in a lot of the moisture and it just keeps becoming stronger with time. Right, like you said. It, and uh, suppose it is, we have bought a, I have bought an apartment, which most of us are doing because it's not very economical for us to buy homes. So we buy an apartment. Now I want to make it as energy independent as possible. Can I do it? Is there a chance for me to do that? Definitely. Then we would say that we are, we already have the envelope of our structure. Right. Now we need to move into what can we do in terms of our finishes. So we can go for environment friendly finishes. So the first thing would be that people generally go into uh, tiles. I would say you go for stone because stone is very cool. Uh, let me interrupt you. You know, when I used to come to Goa as a child, my aunts, my uncles, their homes were made with mud, right? After some time that changed and they, they had this red oxide. Red oxide, yes. And in some homes I've even seen the, the mosaic uh, tiling, the mosaic flooring. It's beautiful, but um, I don't know how, how viable it is today. Are those options still, you know, can be used? Very think? much. If you can do uh, mud floors, nothing like it because they are cost effective, uh, they are sustainable. But unfortunately, they're not always that appealing, Maria, in terms of design, and they require regular maintenance. That's right. So people, when they're rushed for time and they've got these, uh, you know, it's difficult in terms of uh, what, how much time you can give to these, um, you know, these choices that right. you have made, which right. are mindful choices. So that way, then it would be, uh, the next step would be the red oxide, if not mud. Red oxide also is great. It just keeps getting more polished with time. It's a local, absolutely local artisanal, um, you know, art, which we need to, we definitely need to adopt. But we don't have very many um, artists who do uh, red oxide red works. Oxide. And we have to live with the imperfections of nature. Then when we choose red oxide, you have to be okay with the cracks. You have to be okay with the little bit of, uh, that's where then the insects sit and breed because you see then you create you have created an ecosystem. Yes, of course. So if when you make that choice, then you have to be okay to be living with this. But if that is also not acceptable to you, that you would definitely want a one-time intervention, which doesn't require regular, then stone, as I said, would be a good option instead of using tiles. Because when we choose tiles, tiles the the process of manufacturing is not sustainable. You are using high volumes of energy using high volumes of, sand, of um, water and the carbon footprint of where they are manufactured and when they come to you, there's a lot of fuel and a travel cost. Right. So that way if you use a local stone, then you're giving, uh, you know, this is local quarry, you have the Tandu stones, in Belgaum you have the Belgaum stones, uh, Kadapas are there very close by, you use those, I think that they keep very cool, they require no maintenance and they they are timeless and you'll pass it on to the next generation. Uh, so are they more expensive than the tiles that we normally we use today? No, but they are simpler, Maria. So if you're looking for high... If uh, I'm looking for beauty, then uh, I have to give up on it. Yes, so I wouldn't say the yeah, stone is not beautiful, but it's simple and beautiful. <laughs> so you could, uh, you could, what you could is you could enhance this by putting some nice patterns to the stone the way you angle the stone. Secondly, you could put for relief, you could put some kind of these pretty mosaic tiles in the center. They would add design value. Right. Everything is possible as long as we're just mindful of it. Right. Now, one of the problems that is not to just, uh, in Goa so far, it has not been a major problem and we are blessed because of that. But the world over, but the world over water shortage is a problem. 
and with that keeping that in mind how can we minimize the use of of water especially in our gardens like i love having a garden and there i know there are so many who would who love having their little garden so far we have been able you know to have spaces where we can have a garden so what do i do how do i go about it uh in earlier times our concept of having a garden was to just do a large green lawn and to have a couple of shrubs around it at it yeah at the, the periphery yes. and uh, plant a few trees and we have a lovely garden, garden yeah. but over a period of time we realized that that grass requires a lot of maintenance and a lot of water, water. and uh, that is something that i think it's good that now we have the generational shift of uh, your uh, idea of a perfect garden it doesn't have to be a lawn so xeriscaping is very much in now because definitely water as a resource is going is the most critical resource that we are going to be dealing with in the coming okay. years just a moment you said the word xeriscape am i right yes what is so that so xeri uh, in greek xeri means dry so dry landscaping so when we we adopt uh, a lot of uh, colorful pebbles gravel what yes. we use so that stone smaller size so we use those in different colors to create lovely patterns and have a few controlled areas where you are going to be putting some plants so you have lesser plants to water on a day to day basis you don't have to water this open space and yet it is usable for you for any kind of entertainment for your walks and it is allowing the water to actually go into the, uh, the soil and recharge your ground waters So I think it's great to consider xeriscaping as an option if you have large open spaces and of course have your lawns we all love lawns but mm -hmm. be mindful about the size and the rest of the area you can probably adopt principles of xeriscaping right okay so um, we are learning so much from namrata i hope we are able to incorporate what you have been saying now namrata you said you came to goa 23 24 years ago yes in the year 2000 in the year 2000 <laughs> so you have seen goa changing we used to be a land where we used to find turtles migratory birds there has been a major major change changes everywhere if we do not adapt and we don't adopt certain practices we will we will it, you know ultimately perish what are, what do you think about the changes that have come about uh so see progress has three pillars it's the planet the profit and the people so goa has been progressing but if the progress will be skewed if it's not balanced for all the three pillars the mm. people the pr the planet and the profit now the way goa is attracting people at a very um exponential rate where everybody wants to now earlier you would visit goa but now everybody wants to live here also so i think we need to understand that uh, shift that uh, you know the people have and be able to recognize that at the same time goa is not only for the human beings it is also we have such a large biodiversity which we have so many we have mangroves it they are the uh, breeding grounds for all our marine life we have so many forests we have uh, right from tamil nadu karnataka to uh, mahadei which is in goa these were the these was the roots for the elephants so we need to respect that and make sure that when we are uh, when we are making space for this infrastructure to house the requirements of the people we are not in any way harming the other equal shareholders of goa which is the flora and fauna so i think that is very important at the policy level uh, and um, i hope the government is uh, i know that they are they are very aware of this and i am sure that they are going to be making uh, uh, you know the right uh, steps to make sure that they protect everybody the hum the, the flora fauna and our interests uh i think it's very important that wherever wherever we even as designers when we pay, take up any project we need to be mindful of where is it located is it close to a uh, to a creek is it close to a mangrove mm -hmm. and to see to it that whatever kind of construction that you do yeah, it is it is yeah in synchronicity with your immediate surroundings and you build with nature not against it right now they say that crisis either causes people to regress or to progress but that all depends on the will of the people 
what would you advise our viewers and you know everyone who's listening not just now later on as well what would you advise them um, about Goa's conservation how can we conserve the beauty the heritage the rich heritage actually that we have over here what can we do uh, I think uh, with a large influx like I said of, of uh, all of us wanting to be in Goa uh, so we have an increase in our population so I think for starters we can uh, accept that as a reality and start planning for it now when we plan for it we also need to know that like i said that what who are the other people who equally uh, share goa which is uh, all the birds the animals and uh, then the waterways that we have but at the same time in terms of economics so what i have understood about goa is that we are uh, definitely mining was our primary uh, source, source economic yeah. source yes and then we have the fisheries and then we have tourism so I think if we just do a very fine balance and we we if we like for instance if you're doing mining we adopt um, environment friendly principles practices. we can't wish it away so we need to do environment friendly practices on how we do it the right way same with goes with tourism and the same it goes with fisheries you know we don't over exploit our marine resources so I think if we just go by doing everything that we're doing but do it in a very controlled way I have I and Goa has a very very aware population people are very aware of uh, and they are very I think respectful about uh, you know all the natural resources so I am quite confident that Goa is, Goa is going to grow uh, in all its uh, various aspects balancing it's going to be a tough act it is going to be yes because, because like you said those three pillars are so important and we need to maintain that it's not going to be easy like Namrata said there are going to be there are going to be obstacles with the influx of people coming in. There are going to be a lot of challenges because um, don't mean to to hurt anyone, but there are people who come in and don't realize, you know, our culture, don't realize our practices, and then you see them doing things that don't are not aligned with our think way of thinking. And I think people need to realize that when you come to Goa, it is so full of you know of rich of richness we have so much to be thankful and grateful for and we would like to maintain that and i think as you said goans are are naturally more aware you yeah, know very and, much and very we much, want yes. to retain that we love our state we love our land and we love our, our people of course so we want to maintain that now namrata what is the first step just one step that you could share with our audience that we can take to reduce our carbon footprint everybody gives us a lot of common um, you know advice and tips what is that something that is different that you think that would definitely make some change somewhere I would but before that I want to just pick on the previous point which you said about how Goa has such a great culture or any state for that matter uh, has most of our states have a have a lot of um, you know uh, ancient practices and culture so I I because uh, maybe because I was always uh, traveling my dad was in the armed forces mm -hmm. and then so was my husband so when we've been traveling to different states so I think there's one thing that I learned was that whichever state we went to we respected that culture and tried to imbibe that so I would think it's very important that everybody who decides to choose uh, Goa as their new home needs to respect this culture and imbibe it and um, I think that that uh, that uh, one step itself would hopefully you know change things let's work with the ways of the land that you choose to want to be and respect those rather than maybe imposing our ways onto that particular piece of land that raise, r rises uh, that arises to conflict I would think so that's my personal opinion so basically what you're saying and what comes to mind is when in Rome do what the Romans do absolutely so when in Goa do what the Goans do I mean be <laughs> mindful of everything and we respect uh, not just our, peop uh, our people of course each other but we also respect what we have what we are blessed with what we have we are very aware of that yes a yes. great blessing that we have to live here to have such a beautiful natural resources and um, Yes, coming back to your question. Yes. yes. So uh, I, I think most of uh, most of us are already very mindful of uh, not 
choosing plastic as an option and moving to glass bottles and glass tiffins or carrying your own bag for grocery. So these yes. are very small things which we can do at an individual uh, level, but let us not undermine its significance because you start one, you then you become a community and there you become uh, an influencer and you actually start working upwards to change the mindset and your children are watching you. What you are going to do, your children are going to do. So I think it's very important to understand that. Uh, but uh, now when we build, like if I'm just specific to what we do, whenever you're building a home or whenever you're designing a space, I think it's very good to go for the, always figure out what are the environment friendly options available to you. The quickest and fastest that you will come to your table will probably be what has been made very quickly and maybe not necessarily respecting either the traditional practices or the environment. So I think we need to just take a little pause there. For example, when you're choosing a paint, why don't you just check and see which of them are certified as a sustainable way of arriving at this paint. So uh, when you're doing a roof, when you're going to go that this is my roof, why don't you see what are my environmental options? Maybe instead of just doing a concrete slab, maybe I can do it in ceramic tiles. Maybe I can do it in the local tiles. Maybe I can do it in wood. Maybe I can do it in bamboo. So I think it's very good to start being open to the eco-friendly options. Start questioning all the choices which are being put forward to you and be more mindful of your selections. Right, right. So it starts from, from small, you know, practices. Like you said, it starts with the plastic, then it comes to your home, and it comes with teaching our children. Children learn from us, for sure. And everything that uh, we do, somehow or the other, they mirror it, you know. So, uh, listening to you with, after this conversation, I hope we can bring about more change. We have already changed. I, the change is there around. I, it is there for you and me to see, and we are becoming more and more mindful. But Namrata, the change needs to be there. And I think, as Namrata has says, design, the way we design our home can save lives. Design can save lives. We have to be more mindful. And we have to remember, we have to live and let live. Not just people around us, not just the economy, but our natural resources as well. Namrata, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. I have learned and relearned. And I hope that we will be able to adapt uh, adopt the practices that that you have spoken about thank you so much thank you thank you it's been such a pleasure Mary. it has been a pleasure for us <laughs> as well uh, to all our viewers thank you for your time for your patience and until next time take care <music>